Let's talk a little bit more about the coronavirus pandemic. Joining us now, Deborah Davis. She's an epidemiologist uh, advising governments and policymakers. Uh, she's worked with the World Health Organization, the United Nations, and the International Monetary Fund. Deborah, um, you know, we had a piece from Jim Spellman a bit back uh, where he talked about uh, the cherry blossoms and how it's attracting people. We've seen all these spring breakers. Um, Talk to me about, you know, the flattening of the curve. We've heard a lot about this. We've, we've actually seen how China and Asia, how, how we've actually seen it. But in Italy, it's just spiked. They didn't really take it seriously. And it seems like here in the United States, a lot of millennials and others uh, still not taking this seriously. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right, Mike. It's a huge problem. And the millennials are going to be in for a big surprise. We have some new data that just were released from CDC today that says that one out of five deaths in the United States occurred in people under the age of 65. In fact, the age group 20 to 44 has a rather higher rate of hospitalization than we thought. So uh, although in the beginning, the first data out of China suggested that the millennials were uh, not as vulnerable, I have a theory about why that might have been the case. Uh, I teach at Sichuan University in Chengdu, and as you know very well, uh, the one-child policy was in effect for many people who are now in their 20s to early uh, 40s. So they are often single children. There aren't as many of them demographically in the population in China mm. as there are in other populations. So they were disproportionately lower in, in representation in the initial cases that were uh, determined as well. Now the new data from CDC indicates that this group, the millennials, are actually at some risk and moreover, males are at greater risk than females. Uh, at every age group, and uh, uh, we have some theories about why that is the case. Well, that's a, a fascinating bit of, uh, of information I don't think a lot of us were thinking about. I mean, I was thinking about diet, the diets being different here in the United States and, and uh, in Asia as well. Perhaps that contributed. But let me ask you about, uh, President's been talking a lot about different drugs available. I know that you've been studying what's, what's worked in Wuhan. Kind of give me your sense of the landscape out there. What may be effective, what may not be, and, and also, should the U.S. president be talking about these drugs when, when there's really not a lot of efficacy about them? Uh, well, you know, the president likes to be an optimist, but we have to be a realist when it comes to public health data. As Dr. Fauci reminded us, uh, we, we, um, you can trust in God, but you have to believe in data. And the data at this point do not exist to show that chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine or some of the other antivirals that have been effective against Ebola that they are necessarily would be effective against uh, the uh, mutated coronavirus, COVID-19. In fact, we have reason for concern that those drugs might not work as well or they could create what's called a cytokine storm. And in people who are already compromised by the coronavirus, they may also have underlying cardiac issues because we are seeing more and more of that show up as well. So I think we need to be a little less enthusiastic about the drug option. And I'm very encouraged that the Shanghai Medical Society has actually recently um, made a recommendation about something that appears to work with a significant number of people uh, in Wuhan. And I'm referring uh, to the use of vitamin C prophylactically to be taken as a drug, but also apparently it's being used intravenously and it is recommended now by the Shanghai Medical Society uh, for the treatment of cases that are hospitalized. Uh, that is intravenous vitamin C. It's, uh, I know that there's quite a bit of it often manufactured in China, and there have been a number of studies showing that it's, number one, that it can be safe, which is important. Those studies have been done across the board, often with cancer patients, by the way, who have used it in combination with chemotherapy drugs. And there have been a number of studies now. Um, I think the most remarkable one is, to be quite frank, is an anecdote. It's not a study, but I want to share it with you, if I may. There was a family of five adults in, in Wuhan. Uh, the oldest member of that family became quite ill. She, in fact, developed the virus. All the members of that family every day took vitamin C between three to six grams, as much as you can take without having upset stomach. The woman who was elderly was hospitalized with coronavirus. She went into the ICU, and as you know, more than half of those who go into the ICU that are elderly do not come out. The, the family insisted that she be given intravenous vitamin C while she was in the ICU. None of the family members, not a single one, developed the virus, although they were all taking care of the sick woman. 
and she recovered. Now that's an anecdote. It's not the data that we need. However, when you tie that to other studies that have been done, and there have been some studies done on vitamin C, it's now, I think, very important for China, but also for the rest of the world to understand that vitamin C may turn out to be a very promising therapy, a therapy for people who are sick, and more importantly, can be used as a preventive agent, mm -hmm. I think, for the rest of us. Well, so Deborah, uh, unfortunately, we run out of time, but thank you so much, and it's always good to end on a positive note. So you've given us a little th something uh, positive, which is not a lot of it out there right now. Thank you very much.